And in our top story today, temperatures hit record highs in Japan as a heat wave swept across the country. A late spring heat wave burned its way into the record books in the eastern U.S. today. One week into June, America is in the grip of pulverizing summer heat. Half the population of the United States was under a heat advisory today. Nationwide, at least 22 people are dead. I prepared this simple video as a wake-up call to all communicators of climate change. Hi. My name is James Shikada, and I'm a writer of an ambitious climate change film project. I'm a great believer in the power of film and its unique ability to educate while providing thrilling entertainment that can amplify and bind its lessons with an emotional experience making it memorable and for some of us, everlasting. Over the past century, films have radically altered our societal perceptions on everything from racial prejudice to the plight of our wildlife. Four years ago, seeing that there were no major films being released on our climate realities besides an inconvenient truth, I decided to dedicate my time to do for climate change what film has done for all of our vital causes. So I developed a dynamic cinematic narrative that is emotionally engaging to make the learning experience far more appealing to the average person and to deliver the true science to the maximum population. A powerful educational tool to intelligently counteract the growing forces of climate skepticism. The very idea of a major film production on climate change appears unnecessary to many. The question is often raised, why not do it with television? Television is our best chance to educate our public. In a recent Rolling Stone magazine article, Al Gore writes, the conversation that matters the most to the shaping of the public mind now takes place on television. Newspapers and magazines are in decline, the internet still in its early days. The average American is watching television an astonishing five hours a day. In the average household, at least one television set is turned on more than eight hours a day. The gatekeepers charge large rents for the privilege of communicating to the American people over the only medium that really affects their thinking. In 2008, I attended the Sheffield International Dog Fest, where I talked with many network insiders, including Phil Dolling, producer of the groundbreaking series, Earth, the Power of the Planet. He explained how after the ratings fell on productions on climate change, National Geographic and Discovery were to focus on lighter programs based on positive ratings about the beauty of the planet and do away with environmental doom and gloom. Henceforth, Information on climate change was to be subtle and serve only as reminders. This approach was even campaigned by Martin Atkin, head of creative development at Greenpeace International. Climate facts are our only facts of reality that has been cleverly separated from our rules of journalistic reporting. And in recent years, it's been seen as something to be desperately avoided, creating a climate that has made it extremely hard for a fact-based educational approach such as mine to gain support. But how did we arrive at this popular consensus? Every other month, there's an article released urging against the so-called scaremongering or fear-based appeals. So what exactly constitutes scaremongering in climate education? Upon deeper search, I have discovered some inconvenient truths about climate education. Many proponents of renewables now argue that climate education has been covered, and that solutions must now become our main focus, with energy independence is our key motivation. It is a point that is most articulately argued by Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus, who go a step further in proposing that the entire matter of climate change and its science be expelled from energy policy in the United States. Michael and Ted are co-founders of Breakthrough Institute, a political think tank that deals with energy and economic policy. In 2004, they generated a national debate with the book The Death of Environmentalism, which argued against apocalyptic climate rhetoric. And for their work, they were named among Time Magazine's Heroes of the Environment, 2008. In their 2010 essay, which was in clear reaction to ClimateGate, Michael and Ted writes, The danger today is that the discrediting of the science will wash back into the larger effort to transform our energy policy. Now is the time to free energy policy from climate science. 
The truth is that once climate science becomes detached from the expectation that we will establish a standard for allowable global carbon emissions that every nation on earth will heed, no one will much care about the hockey stick or the disaster loss record, save those whose business, as scientists, is to attend to such matters. But that is not all we will no longer care about. If silence on climate change becomes government policy, public skepticism will rise much further. Globally, the consequences of climate change is the leading public driver in CO2 reduction and sequestration, from sustainable agriculture and forest protection to the challenging of big coal. The incentive of peak oil and energy independence neither inspire sequestration or cut back in localized coal. CO2 from coal is responsible for over 40% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. So how did we go from the passionate concerns of an inconvenient truth to our possible silence on climate change? Here's a viewpoint of what happened, according to Michael. An inconvenient truth became a global media sensation. Seemingly every magazine in this country, including Sports Illustrated, released a special green issue. Fortune 500 com companies pledged to go carbon neutral, Paris dimmed the lights on the Eiffel Tower, solar investments became hot even for oil companies. In addition to winning an Oscar and a Nobel Prize, Gore's movie single-handedly almost revitalized the climate movement. Youth climate activism, which had virtually been non-existent prior to 2006, exploded on college campuses, and in the fall of 2007, 12,000 youth activists convened at a conference in Washington to demand uh, climate policies like cap and trade. In the spring of 2008, Congress restarted the dormant effort to pass cap and trade legislation, and major candidates from both parties promised to reduce carbon emissions 80% by 2050. And yet, today, environmental efforts to address climate change and build a green economy lie in ruins. So what went wrong? The green bubble of seemingly widespread interest in climate change and green jobs was, it turns out, primarily an elite phenomenon. Indeed, the only impact that either an inconvenient truth or the green jobs movement had on public opinion was to increase public skepticism about climate science and to polarize public support for both climate and clean energy action. From virtually the moment that an inconvenient truth was released, public skepticism about global warming began to rise. But could this not have been the result of the fact that at the time, half of the American electorate had voted for Bush twice? Believing in Al Gore was near acknowledgement of the fact that they were wrong on both counts, and no one apparently found it necessary to make an alternative film on climate change that was actually suitable for conservatives. An explanation of why the so-called fear-based appeal has failed, an inconvenient truth is the most commonly cited. It seems even the doubtful agree that the film had by far the greatest impact on climate change awareness and action. Just one major film on the most critical crisis that mankind has ever faced. If film has proven to be the most potent and effective tool in reaching our masses, logically should we not invest more in films that could have a far greater, more positive impact by way of alternative formats? Surely, it wasn't just Al Gore's lecture style and likable personality that kept us all involved in the content. Over time, factual films can radically improve through alternative formats in narrative, acting, editing, score, and a million tiny little choices that could make all the difference to how an audience reacts. Change one aspect, and our preconceptions of how we think we will react is made irrelevant. A fine art, forever evolving according to the successes and failures of prior attempts. But on the subject of climate change, we have spent more on a single Hollywood feature film than all the world's major factual TV networks have collectively spent on films dealing with this issue. So why on earth did we bail on climate education? Today's anti-climate education verdict, favored by the major factual TV networks as well as much of the media establishment, is based on recommendations by two well-publicized studies. One by America's Frameworks Institute in 2001, and the other one by Britain's Institute for Public Policy Research in 2006. While there have been newer studies since, their key recommendations remain virtually identical. The results of the studies are best explained in this company article of 2006. Both sets of research conclude that existing approaches to discussing global warming may be counterproductive leaving the public feeling disempowered and uncompelled to act. The research by IPPR 
found that global warming is most commonly constructed in the UK through the alarmist repertoire. It's awesome, terrible, immense, and beyond human control. The difficulty with this approach is that the scale of the problem as it is shown excludes the possibility of real action by the reader or viewer. Both UK and US research found that another problematic approach to discussing global warming is one which stresses the large scale of global warming and then tells people they can solve it through small actions, like changing a light bulb. One problem with this is that it easily lapses into wallpaper, the domestic, the routine, the boring. Worse, bringing together these two approaches without reconciling them, juxtaposing the apocalyptic and the mundane, seems likely to highlight the obvious question. How could small actions really make a difference to things happening on this epic scale? The British research recommends the less time be spent trying to convince people that climate change is real. Interested agencies now need to treat the argument as having been won. This means simply behaving as if climate change exists and is real, and that individual actions are effective. The facts need to be treated as being so taken for granted that they need not be spoken. When it comes to various communication strategies, these are all valid recommendations, and we can see why our news and factual networks would take it on board. Faced with a continued decline in climate change programs, to them this made perfect sense. Avoid all doom and gloom, which equaled climate facts. Behave as if the climate change argument was settled, and focus only on the positive to improve ratings results. And so a new media policy was introduced that essentially ended climate education via television. But what these networks fail to take into account is the fact that none of these studies have looked into the impacts of actual films on climate change. Here, the IPPR study states, the scope of the study is relatively narrow. A more comprehensive approach might locate a wider range of material in more detail across a wider range of media and over a longer period. Reviews were carried out of 600 articles from newspapers and magazines, as well as of TV and radio news clips and ads, press ads, and websites over three months between late 2005 and early 2006. Films and programs are unlike TV ads in that they can house both science and solution in equal measure, in a way that balances our concerns with a motivational sense of hope. The studies conclude that since the solutions proposed in the earlier years did not match the scale of the crisis, and thus lowered morale, that we should simply remove the crisis. But a lot has changed since 2006. Today, there are advances in technological solutions and proposals and ingenious mega-projects that will perhaps not only boost our morale, but restore our sense of hope. Furthermore, climate solutions in the earlier years were focused on altering the behavior of the average citizen through absurdly minute actions, which I would argue had a much greater impact in causing our skepticism than anything regarding the evidence of climate change itself. Provided there is a balanced understanding in the urgency and cause of why we need solutions in the first place, there are more intelligent and effective ways of motivating our public than to simply shield their view of what we must confront. But even before the factual media verdict, film strategies were shockingly limited. Like with any TV network, Artistic trial and error was considered a financial risk. The network guideline was to stick to the boring old, tried and tested documentary format. Cost cutting with the same old recycled footage, visual references on climate change were in poor taste and badly edited, without specific timeline, context or purpose. You've seen one, you've seen them all. By lack of imagination, these programs failed to balance facts with solutions and fail to engage audiences. But rather than dealing with it creatively, this was blamed on climate information itself. And so a one-size-fits-all policy is followed, denying film the opportunity to improve. Fortunately, there are some that do not follow, like America's ABC News, which recently tested a bold new narrative with their Earth 2100. New formats through cinematic art can radically alter our perception. Like a cinematic plot, there are ways to convey the difficult realities of our crisis in profound, resonating ways, while at the same time entertaining our necessary senses through clever ways of tasteful presentation. It is all about how the story is told. If we were given the outline to the film Avatar years ago, 
We would have left. It is hard to convey what is possible. We have an enormous challenge facing us. With the increased demand for energy in the world, there is a growing concern about the risk of climate change. And with that comes a need to find technology to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One of the best things that we could do is to be efficient in the use of our energy. The less energy we use... Increasingly, oil company adverts are becoming identical to the awareness programs now being aired by renewable energy and climate action groups. Not only in their message, but their positive visuals, which are hard to tell apart. On television, the public is exposed to far more adverts by oil giants passing themselves off as heroes of the environment than any actual programs on climate change and its solutions. And many of the programs that do exist to serve our awareness have recently been funded and produced by oil giants. These are a series of programs on renewable technology solutions by Discover Channel. Powering the Future is presented by Shell. Building the Future is presented by BP. So just how green are these petroleum companies? We know that more energy use means more CO2 at a time when the climate can ill afford it. But we're working on it. We are working on ways. After all that talk of renewables, in 2009, Shell, the world's third largest oil giant, pulled out of wind and solar projects. And in 2011, again, pulled out of sustainable algae biofuel in favor of Brazilian sugarcane an industry that is currently restricted by the Brazilian government over fears of deforestation. Contributing $2 billion into the industry will no doubt ease those restrictions. Until now, the company has only spent a minuscule 0.6% of its annual investment on renewables, from which most projects were canceled. Uh, we need renewable, renewable energy. energy is vital to our planet. You hear about alternatives, right? Wind, solar, algae. I think it's going to work on a big scale, and I think it's going to be affordable. So, where are they? It has to work in the real world. At Chevron, we're investing millions in solar and biofuel technologies to make it work. Chevron, ranked third most profitable company by Fortune magazine, has so far invested $250 million into alternative energy over the last decade, which amounts to just 0.1% of their $200 billion sum in annual profits. They have recently announced that they will invest $2 billion into renewables over the next few years. Their first project is an advanced solar power plant that will power the 9,183 active oil wells in one of the oldest and dirtiest oil fields in the world. The company's current online slogan? Find newer ways, cleaner ways to power the world. Chevron spends around 19 million a year on advertising. The big question on everyone's mind today is how are we going to continue to obtain the supplies of energy that we need while caring for the environment? We have to develop all the options available to us and manage greenhouse gas emissions. ExxonMobil is the world's largest corporation and oil company, ranked first in Fortune magazine's most profitable for the eighth year consecutive. They have announced they will put $600 million into algae farms that will turn sunlight into green biofuel. That is a fantastic direction, but to put it into context, it is still only 2% of their annual profit. In 2009, Forbes magazine names Exxon Green Company of the Year for expanding into natural gas, which is carbon-wise better than coal, but is currently responsible for around 20% of U.S. carbon emissions. And the shift is necessary, for Exxon is running out of oil. And let's not forget, ExxonMobil and Chevron have given millions to organizations and think tanks that right now still continues to spread their disinformation on climate change. Congress is considering a law branding carbon dioxide as pollution. This will cost us jobs. Carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are emitted from engines and power plants. While carbon monoxide is often harmful, it's been proven that higher levels of carbon dioxide result in more plant growth and less water required for plants to grow faster and larger. Take action. Contact your senator and congressman today and remind them that CO2 is not a pollutant and more CO2 results in a greener earth. Go to CO2isGreen.com because we all need CO2. Am I wrong to think that each time they earn our trust with ads, that they automatically remove their backing of renewables? 
And if so, isn't our green stamp of approval what actually allows them to do so? After all, their images of green tech is no different to ours. Clearly, the solutions-based strategy to educate and motivate the public has been hijacked by the oil giants that have all the PR money in the world to perfect their message. The more we focus purely on the solution strategy, the more they will simply follow us with images more beautiful and hopeful than ever in an endless PR game that we cannot win. But the one thing that the oil giants cannot duplicate is the reality-based approach with truthful science-based education, which is why they have done everything to discredit it. But according to the popular findings on climate awareness, the only option left to us is to continually legitimize the oil giant's message with visuals that are so similar that they may demoralize our youth and relax our concerns. How much longer do we continue to narrow our creative options when it comes to visual media? If we want people to jump up and act, where is the actual difference on our screens that would allow them to do so? You cannot underestimate the enormous political power of Exxon and the rest of the oil industry. They are the richest industry in history. And they have not just control of Congress, but because of their disinformation campaign, they have completely bamboozled the media. And of course, the mass media is the main source of most Americans' information on this. And the mass media has done an embarrassing, professionally embarrassing job of covering this issue for 20 years. I refer to it as journalistic malpractice because they have taken the sort of on the one hand, on the other hand approach to covering this issue. It's not on the one hand and on the other hand when it is a matter of science. You should not be pretending that there are two points of view about gravity or evolution or climate change. And unfortunately, our media has done that. And so that has sapped the kind of political pressure that we need. Our media has been utterly spineless in reporting climate change and its essential science. Instead of the routine educational updates afforded to any other legitimate science-related news, the media instead labeled climate change as a subject of controversy. Since heated debate between skeptic and expert fared better on ratings, the battle over climate change was forever milked, excusing them from having to provide the science for over a decade. If you think about it, the cost of promulgating international rules is zilch. Why on earth are they not there? But the reason they're not there is that until we have a critical mass of informed citizens in our own societies, politicians will get away with gestures, right? things that look good but don't work. The subject of public denial is what primarily drives the argument for less climate change in media, which in turn allows for greater denial. I refer to a new study by researchers at UC Berkeley, which was apparently in response to an appeal by Michael and Ted, which claims that our skepticism can be explained by a thing called system justification theory. Information about the potentially dire consequences of global warming threatens deeply held beliefs that the world is just, orderly, and stable. Individuals overcome this threat by denying or discounting the existence of global warming. And this process ultimately results in decreased willingness to counteract climate change. The study was simple. Students were asked to read one or two articles, one on the dire warnings of climate change, and the other focused on potential solutions. And the result? If the same messages are delivered, coupled with a potential solution, the information can be communicated without creating a substantial threat to deeply held beliefs in a just world. Fear-based appeals, especially those not coupled with a clear solution, can backfire and undermine the intended effects of the messages. These findings are hardly breaking news. When it comes to film education, no filmmaker in their right mind will fail to include positive solutions into a climate change film production. But from such studies, Michael and Ted have come away with the simple conclusion that offering increasingly dire prognosis about the fate of the planet have undermined public confidence in climate science. They also write, The lesson of recent years would appear to be that apocalyptic threats, when their impacts are relatively far off in the future, difficult to imagine or visualize, and not an external or hostile source, are not easily acknowledged and are unlikely to become priority concerns for most people. But today, the impacts of climate change poses a clear and present danger. 
is evidenced by our daily news, with no visualization or imagination required. But sadly today, these images can neither be shed nor explained in a scientific context because of the network policies which was inspired by the likes of Michael and Ted. Without visual education on how to identify the signals all around us, there is good reason why we aren't alarmed enough at this time. Especially when the only party that is unrestricted from discussing the science due to asinine policies are the skeptics whose insane counter theories have remained largely unchallenged in the media. If the atmospheric composition had stayed at the pre-industrial amount of CO2, 280 ppm, would the Russian heat wave had occurred? Extremely heavy rainfall in Pakistan have occurred. And the answer is almost certainly not. The probability of getting that without this change in um, atmospheric composition is would, very small. Let's compare the issue with an example of another major subject. Ratings on programs on the Iraq war were far less than the coverage of homecoming events for the returning troops. So let's say the news networks made the decision to no longer report on the war itself and concentrate instead on the returning troops and images of happy greeting faces. If the objective is to boost morale for the country, the mission is accomplished. So why should anyone object? The networks are earning bigger profits. We will object because people are dying. The war is affecting the safety of our loved ones. And without seeing what is happening with our eyes, we may never understand the true reason to end it. If that were to happen in real life, the world will be enraged and demand that the media report what is happening. What separates the issues of climate change from this scenario? Nothing. Due to what are mainly financial motivations, our mainstream media is heading in the wrong direction. Inventive strategies that could truly impact the world are being rejected. Indisputable evidence is being suppressed. Corporate disinformation is left unchallenged. And oil giants are now running their own green PR campaigns that are demoralizing to the activists within us. We can understand the predicament of the journalists who are stuck in the system. But for those of us with the total freedom of objectivity, there are no excuses. In regards to funding, we ought to reprioritize climate education next to renewable R&D. Per dollar invested, it is by far the most globally effective solution that is worth our time. Many of us think that we are protecting our children and families by shielding them from the hard truth. But as events transpire, the consequences of that choice will be made clear. While we must reach the majority, our salvation lies in winning our empathetic minority. And without powerful words and images that tugs at our very humanity, our battle is lost. In 2004, right before the US presidential election, I made a series of anti-Iraq war poster images which I sent to a number of activist websites. What motivated me to do this was not what I saw on CNN, but pictures I found on the internet. This girl was killed. Her leg is in shreds. That child should not be lying there. These things should not be happening. But what's worse? The future misery of billions of our children through heat stroke, hunger, and war of our natural resources should not be happening. It isn't fear we want to entice. It is outrage. We must be able to actually see what the problem is in order to find a reason within us to fix it. The truth has the power to fundamentally alter our attitudes for the rest of our lives. Are we to get real about this crisis? Because without that motivation, we have nothing. If ever you get the chance, please support projects such as mine or anything that is like it. Judging by where this debate is headed, it will be our very last chance to deliver the truth to the public. Let's let the people decide for themselves what is necessary for our change. This has been James Shikata. Thank you very much for listening.